Hello. Welcome, Welcome to instructional design <laughs> from the ground up. We are live for the first time and it's really it's it's a fun thing to experience here. You have to excuse me. I'm losing my voice a little bit tonight. I think it's allergies, but bear with me. If I lose my voice, I am sure Chuck will take over whatever I'm saying, right, Chuck? Because by now, yeah. oh yeah, I you kind of know yeah. what I'm going to say. I think. If you want to come back a half hour, just let us know. We'll do it. It's all That's live. Right. We're going to have fun. This, you know, no pressure tonight. So. That's right. If we're coughing or giggling or any other mannerisms that people find offensive, then. Thank you. You're yeah. Welcome. Hey, sorry. You know, yeah. that's it. You are going to get the authentic us tonight. We yeah, are not. For that, we apologize. I don't even have my professional clapboard that I usually no, use. No, no, no. Where's the slate? You got to have the slate. You I don't even have. It? Oh, I do have it. We got big dollars invested in that. All right. I'm getting it. I'm, I'm like, it's right here. Wow. Uh, what next? Whoops. You know? Bear with me. Sorry if I just okay. made a really loud Make, noise with do my. Do the slate. Do yeah. the slate. Okay. All right. I'm getting the slate. Getting official. the slate. Chuck, oh, it's in a thing? Chuck, yes. <laughs> I got to keep it protected, Chuck. Chuck yeah. purchased this thing for me and because, you know, we have a lot of bloopers. When we're pre-recording things, we have a bloopers. lot of bloopers. <laughs> and so this helps me to know where yeah. I need to cut. Otherwise, yeah. I would be in post-production for hours. Well, most people have blooper tapes. We have programs <laughs> that we are shorter have, than the bloopers. We have an entire Hollywood production of blooper reels. I we think at this point, thousands, thousands. Yeah, yeah, at this point, we could we could definitely make uh, at least a, oh, yeah. a, a documentary yeah. out of it. I don't know, just how. Uh, I don't. Maybe we could ask one of our viewers to that's a documentary filmmaker to come in and spend I don't know fifteen twenty minutes to do a documentary on the production of this particular YouTube channel and what goes on behind the scenes because all you can really see is this little square of our house and uh you know what you think is us but it's really not us it's all green screen and you know, that's right that's right. this AI. tiger behind me is not no, staring no. at the back of my head no, no, all no. the time no actually the eyes are moving yeah is hector behind that <laughs> he's having some fun pulling the strings <laughs> yeah no i can see the eyes moving it's like one of those haunted house movies that's pretty cool Oh my gosh, we really, what are we doing here? We are here to talk well, about, uh, I don't know, everything and anything ISD apparently. And this is a very special day. This is book launch day. Chuck's mm. book launched today. And I'm going to get the title right this time. <laughs> Introduction <Yeah. laughs> to Instructional Systems Design Theory and Practice launched today. And yep. yeah, you can get your copy on Amazon. And yeah. it's right there, ready to go, and waiting for your reading eyes. Well, for any author, and you know this, Denise, as well as anybody, you know, two best days in an author's life for when you start the book and when you finish the book, <laughs> you know, and everything in between. And then you get that box in the mail with the actual printed copy of it. And you see that there is a physical manifestation of all that work you did. And, you know, it's an incredible thing. And, you know, there have been so many people that have worked on this. It, you know, sure, my name's on it, but if you look at the crew at ATD and ATD Press, um, I could go through a list of names, but I would miss somebody and it wouldn't be fair to them. But these are real professionals. And from the graphics people to the editors, from the, the first copies, there's just like three sets of editors. You know, the yeah. initial set that says, Chuck, what are you talking about? To, you know, the second line of edits is, you know, you've got this in here twice, once in chapter four and once in chapter six, you know, stupid stuff that I don't catch. And then you got the final production editors where they do the layout, do the rest of it. These are real professionals and it's impressive to see them work and it's impressive to see, you know, the product evolve because when you're writing it, you just completely lose the sense of the context of what you're doing. And I don't know if you do that, Denise, when you write, but it's very tough for me sometimes to come to that point of focus of reality about where I try to remember what I've written and the context in which I put it in. That's why, you know, they, that's why there are editors, because for that very reason, struggle. it's really hard. You get lost in, in whatever you're writing. Sometimes you get really mm -hmm. attached to it. Sometimes it's hard to let go of certain passages. And again, you I think a lot of times you end up repeating yourself without even realizing it. Oh, or you have those crutch or, or words and sentences. It, yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm dyslexic, and I'm not horribly dyslexic, but I'm, 
I have this version of it, and there's a name for it which eludes me, but when I type in words, I don't type them incorrectly. I misspell them or I put in different words. And so when I look back at my copy, I'm thinking, where did that come from? <laughs> it's not what I was thinking or it's not what I thought I was typing. So as I go through my own work, you know, I have to decipher, you know, things that I thought I put in there. And clearly I <laughs> put in a word that has nothing to do with what I'm talking well, about. Well, I'm going to tell you what, you're going to, you're going to absolutely love when we bring this little sucker oh, out later see, on. Now that, that's the bane of my existence is the because wheel Because there is a question you. on there and I'm going to make sure that this little oh, ticker yeah, thing you're gonna lands rig on the it. wheel. You're going to rig the wheel. I'm totally going to, like we did last week with Greg Owen. <laughs> yeah, we kind of rigged it. Sorry, Greg. <laughs> Greg Owen Boger. I Forgive totally me. rigged that. I couldn't Forgive help us, it. There were questions I needed to have yeah. answered. Sorry, but not sorry. <laughs> it was too much fun. But yeah, that was a great interview, by the way. Um, as you look through the channel here, if you haven't been here before, take a look at the interviews that we did. And there, these are some really exciting and smart people that are in instructional design. And they do things with this field that a lot of people don't associate with instructional design. So you've got people that, like Erica, doing incredible things with canine conditioning and training for animals and, and that kind of work where she uses ISD and came out of an ISD background. You got Lynn McPherson, Dr. McPherson, who is running a master's program and soon a PhD program in hospice and palliative care, who has a course in each of those programs, instructional design, and uses it extensively in her programs. And then you have Greg, who is an SME expert, and he, he really knows how to get in and work with those folks. Then you got Catherine, who's just, you know, floats on water as far as I'm concerned. She's incredible with her entrepreneur spirit and the things that she does. So look around in here, see if any of this content makes any sense to you or of any value to you. But look at the interviews especially, because I think if you're not interested in this or if you've never had any interest in it, at least find some interest in great people that understand what they're doing and share that with you in these interviews. And I don't know how you felt about it, Denise, but I learned something from each of these. I always do anyway. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not that bright, so you know, it doesn't take much to inform me. But when these really smart people are, are on here and talking to us about how instructional design has made a difference in their lives and in their work and then show product and process to, to share with everybody, I think that's pretty cool. It really is. It's I love hearing their stories and I love the fact that they're from so many different various this th th just a variety of industries and how ISD applies to virtually every industry out there. And Not the those. fact that th th these guests that we've had on so far have been from very, from very different places and how ISD has really helped them to bring value to the world is just a really cool thing to hear and witness. It really is. And I'm looking forward to, we're gonna be having Dr. Greg Williams on our show soon. And he's here right now with us. He's asking us if we are if we have a wheel of fortune. And yes, Greg, we do. <laughs> and hey, Greg, we're look gonna at, wait till we do your thing. interview, buddy. Yeah, we're gonna be. Oh yeah, wait till we your have interview. some questions for you. So when we dig deep on portfolios and learning and performance technology program that that you had at UMBC, you just wait. You just wait. We got <laughs> stuff coming up for you. But uh, welcome, Greg. Glad you're here with us. If you have a question that. You already have an answer for, but want to challenge me, <laughs> please. You want to see me trip over my own words. <laughs> yeah, and Denise, uh, as we were saying before we went live, you know, if we don't get any questions, I'm going to pull out the guitar <laughs> and start singing some of my greatest hit. And, um, <laughs> you know, that'll probably drive our numbers. Can I go lower than zero? <laughs> you know, could viewership be less than zero since we're here? So we have at least two. Uh, That's funny. Where's Vanna? Oh, Greg's asking where Vanna is. All right, I'm just trying well, to get the hang of this whole well, comment thing. Well, Denise, I mean, Vanna pales in comparison, you know. <laughs> Nobody will remember Vanna once Denise hits the big time. Oh, of course. The way I spin that wheel is good. <laughs> so you know, listen. <laughs> I, I mean, you've been working out. You've been trying to get that one arm in shape. And That's you right. Got it. Yeah, I've been trying to work those arms out a little bit. But that's it because, hey, we are all about health and wellness and all of that because we have to be sharp to be able to be productive in this world and in this really? field of ISD. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, so hey, much for the Peloton, huh? I mean, well, you know. I, I did my five kilometers today, so. 
Good I for feel you. Good about myself. Yeah. Good for you. My... I did it backwards too because that just seemed to be more fun. So <laughs> you got to trick the brain a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty easy with mine. <laughs> we could do that. So listen, let's talk about first of all for people who are new to this channel who are just tuning in today. This channel really is a place where Chuck and I come together once a week and we have lively discussions about the ISD world. And we do that in order to learn and share insights so as to help make all of us better instructional designers. That's really the driving force of this channel. That's why we created it. We want it to be a community. We want it to be a place where you can ask your questions and we'll answer them. Chuck will answer them. He's the subject matter expert here in ISD. And he, w w we just really want this to be a reciprocal place where you feel comfortable and we can share insights so that we can make this world a better place through ISD. That's the bottom line, really. Yeah, and it's really important because for the first time we started talking about this, Denise and I agreed this was going to be a conversation. We're not going to do broadcasting. We're not going to put things out there that people are going to look at and, you know, it's a cure for insomnia. That's that's not the point here. While it still may be a cure for insomnia, that's not the intent. And the idea is that this is a field that's growing exponentially. And we want to support the field. We want to support the people in it. We want to support the science of it, the art of it. And the whole notion of let's pay attention to the people that are doing this work because so many of them don't realize they're instructional designers or they may not realize that they're within the world of ISD or within learning and performance technology or any of the other associated fields that are all part of this amalgamation now. So what we want to do is start put things out there to have things for people to think about, to try to open the dialogue so questions and answers are, are easily addressed. And I know when I started in this field, I wish I would have had somebody that I could <laughs> get on and ask questions sometimes anonymously because you don't want to necessarily give away your employer or, or other kinds of information so we'll certainly you know do most of these anonymously as you choose but let's have that dialogue let's have that conversation let's support our field let's make this field grow in a way that makes us all proud and i honestly believe it's growing exponentially i think in the next 10 years this field's going to blow up and people that are in it and don't realize that they're in it are going to figure out they're in it and you know we're going to be there to help absolutely that this segues into a question i want to ask the audience right now whoever's on here right now live or if you're checking the replay out in the comments if you could just tell us what appeals to you most about this industry isd what is it that gets you up out of bed in the morning and makes you want to go and do this kind of work it'd be fun to see some answers here yeah, I'm interested. We get any questions yet, or do I need to start singing? <laughs> well, taking the guitar out. All right, so here we've got a question here. Let's see. Chuck, how is your new book different than your previous ones? Great question, ah, Greg. Good question, Greg. Thank you. Um, this is actually a textbook designed from the ground up. Yes, there's a link. Um, from the ground up to be a textbook. So instead of putting lots of good information in there and having it available as support within a course, it's actually designed to be a course. So whether it's one course, two semesters, three semesters, you know, it's, it's designed for any level of instructional design instruction. So we start at the basics. We look at where all this stuff came from, how it relates to instructional design, how it evolved to instructional design. And then we start to dig deeper into a little bit of the theory. So we Look at learning theory, different ISD models, you know, learning transfer, all of those kind of things. And each of the 17 chapters essentially could be a week in a course. And we learn theory, we also learn practice. So design plans, lesson plans. If you're into higher end things like critical, criticality, we can show you how to determine what content should be in a course if you have some tough decisions to make. And Content Mastery Continuum, you know, where do you start learners using Bloom's Taxonomy or any of these other approaches that you might have. So the other books were books, they, lots of good information. This is a textbook and it is ATD's first textbook. And I think that's significant because they've now decided that instructional design is a field that they want to support at lots of different levels. And yeah, it's time to have a real textbook in the field. 
Absolutely. Melody, right, is saying that it helps people, helping people grow is a big motivator. I completely agree because it's, it's really when you make it about other people, it's so powerful and you can do that. Yeah, it's, ISD is a field where you can make such a difference in other people's lives. Well, I'm a big believer in paying forward and I've been very lucky in my career. And, you know, the things that I've learned, a lot of them I've learned the hard way, but, you know, I've had some help along the way. J. Marvin Cook, who was founder of the ISD program in 68, and he took me under his wing for some reason. I thought he was lonely that week or, <laughs> you know, what was up with Marvin, but uh, he, he really helped me out. And for me to be able to teach 602 in our program, Learning Performance Technology Program, which is a course that was his course. He designed it, you know, he taught it from 1968 till essentially um, two or three people between me and him for a term or two, but I had the honor of taking it over. And he helped me so much. And he gave me the best advice about writing in this field that I think anybody could have ever given to me. When I told him I was gonna write for ATD and I'd written a couple info lines and I did an introduction to an anthology of ISD for them back in the dark ages when we put it in stone tablets and things. <laughs> and he told me, Chuck, don't write a theoretical higher end college textbook. If you do that, I'm not gonna to talk to you. Write it for practitioners. You can include all this other stuff in there, but write it for people that go to work tomorrow. People are gonna use the information. You know, theory is great. You need to have the foundation. You need to appreciate where things came from, but don't write a book that you're gonna get so deep into it that you can't find your way out. And he was exactly right. And so this evolution of paying forward with Melody's talking about, I mean, it's, it's like up here in West Virginia. You know, we have a we have some weird things that we do to pay forward. So anybody who knows me knows I go to Dunkin' Donuts seven times a day. Cause it's, <laughs> I'm just that easy, you know, so I drive through there. And we have a thing up here in West Virginia, the one here in Hedgesville, that we now pay for whoever's behind us. You know, and this is not, you know, people do this all over, but we do it up here too. But it's such a great a, feeling when you can do a that. A silly degree, right? So every time I go in, I say, what do they order behind me? And they'll tell me. And I say, okay, put it on my tab. And then you hear them honk as they pull up and figure it out. And then they pay for who's behind them. And then eventually somebody gets the person that's in line is ordering for the entire office, which comes out you know, $700 seven hundred dollars or something. Oh. So Has that ever happened break. to you? Uh, no, because I'd pay it because I'm just that stupid. But uh, So it's just this whole notion. That's a simplistic example of it. But, you know, people have paid forward for me back when, you know, I was very young and making very stupid mistakes. And they took me under their wing and, and, and tried to help me as much as you can help somebody you know, when they go through these phases in their life. And one of the creeds that I've always tried to go with is I want everybody to have a better day because of something I've done for them. And educationally, I want them to have a better life, a better job, better career. I want them to have better relationships with the people they work with. I want them to be happy with their jobs. I don't want people driving to work and just gritting their teeth or wake Too up in the morning do now, that. turn on the computer. And so you just, you see it in their face and you feel it in, the, in their body language. And if there's anything I can do to make them feel better about their work, and I think one of the things you can do as an instructor, as a professor, or whatever you happen to be, is you give them information they can use. This is how you go from A to B to C. And if this happens, let's think about these things. And if that happens, let's think about those things. And I think that's my job. And I really think it's that simple. Yeah. Well, yeah. he's right. You, know, you, lead, about... you, lead, you lead people along with their own, their own thinking, but you're there as their mentor, their guide, sharing with them insights that you've learned along the way. And that really is the, the pinnacle of what humanity is and what being a, yeah, a good, responsible so. citizen is and being able to pay it forward that way with knowledge, sh learning things, sharing it with others. And that makes the world a better place because if everybody could just do that, really. I mean, that then knowledge is power. And when it's shared like that, it's, it creates a sense of community. And that's what I feel about at UMBC, I'm in part of I'm part of the program, the Learning and Performance Technology Program, and it's such a sense of community within with the instructors, with Greg Williams, Dr. Greg Williams, the program director. 
with the staff and with the peers, with my, with my peers. It, yep. we, we all want to learn from each other and we want to share things. And it's, it's just a magical thing when, you can, when everybody can come together and create that kind of atmosphere and environment. I see some comments here. Greg says, it's, it's always timely. ISD is always timely. For example, with COVID-19, there's a lot of ISD application. Isn't that so true, right? How yeah. COVID-19 just brought about so much work for ISD because we had to get a workforce. ISD, <clears throat> that field had to get the people ready for this workforce where yeah. overnight things changed. So it's, it, there's a lot of opportunity that sprang from a bad situation. Well, it's like I've said for a long time, at least the last 14 months, is instructional designers already knew that this was out there. We were completely prepared. We know how to design courses, whether it's room to Zoom or using learning management systems or whatever uh, distributed learning model you want to talk about or, or process. Um, we were there. We've been doing this. And for most designers, it's a matter of scale. So now I have five courses in a college that were doing this way before this, and now I have 500. And so I think the challenges were scaling for a lot of designers, because there's really not a lot new here. Um, we've been doing this for a while, but it caught people off guard. And if you're used to classroom learning and that was your mode of de design and delivery, then you had a little catching up to do, but designers are okay with that. You know, we look at our populations, we look at our challenges, we look at our options for distribution, and we come up with an answer that works. And I have to say, I'm extremely proud of what designers have done. And even folks that don't know their instructional designers, look at the hundreds of thousands of classroom teachers in K-12 that are out there every day, rooming to Zooming, and they're clever. Um, they're putting on costumes for the kids, for the learners. They're sitting out in the snow you know, with their laptop, you know, anything to try to build community and relationship. And I know that they've all tried very hard and done the very best. And even on the fly, they've designed some amazing things. So now going forward, instructional design's about, I think, having plan B. Okay, what's next? You know, this pandemic is not a one-off. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be other things that happen. And whether it's just attitude about going to work and going to class, and most people decide they'd rather do it remotely because it fits their life or their time better. Um, I think demands are gonna change, population expectations are gonna change. And I think in the long term, instructional design has already got the tools to be able to do all this, but it's gonna be great work. And you know what, I love a challenge. Give me the worst mess you got <laughs> and give me two weeks to fix it because that's where I like to be. I really do. Yes. I, Put the parachute on and drop me in, and let's go. <laughs> I love that. That's great. You're ready. Roll up the sleeves, go into Good. the trenches, and get the work done. You know, I want right? to be the one that gets dirty, and I'm the one that everybody gets mad at. Um, that's fine. Let's fix it. Let's make it work. And there are thousands of people just like me. Instructional designers are a gritty, tough group, and they're so detail-oriented, and they're so mission and purpose focused it's just an incredible group of people yeah absolutely um we have a comment that's saying it's how to implement online education and training is another issue where isd is central so oh, it's a absolutely. nice summary of what you just said there and how yeah isd we're ready for whatever well <laughs> i think the change is here's the thing that happens when you go from classroom to online you got to change the way you deliver information and content. You go from a bulk broadcasting model, which is standing in front of a room, which we've done for centuries, hundreds of centuries. And, you know, you broadcast one-on-one -on -one the classroom from, you know, two people sitting around a fire to the one-room classroom to the traditional classroom of up to the 50s and 60s. And that was okay. You could broadcast information the way they were doing it. It was effective and efficient for them, and that's fine. But on online, you've got to learn new things. And the biggest thing you have to learn is to packet your information, to break it up into usable pieces. And sometimes so small that you put it on social media. So it's 140 characters. Um, I can design a course on Twitter if that's what we need to do. Yeah. And you have to change the way that you divide up content and information. You have to change the relationship between the sender and the receiver, between the instructor and the learner. And sometimes you don't even have an instructor. 
sometimes in LMS, it's that box. You dial in, you get the screen, you go do your work. And designers are ready for that, but you have to be more efficient. Yeah. So we're getting, we're getting some questions, and I want to urge and encourage, I should say, people who are viewing this live or even in the replay, Go ahead and put some questions in the comment section yeah, here. Yeah, put and lots of questions in yeah, there. Yeah, this way we can stump, we can stump the stooge. See if you can fix something <laughs> that I can't answer, because <laughs> I'm ready, and I will tell you if I don't have an He's answer. He's been saying that since the day I met him. <laughs> right? Is that not true? I am ready. Try to stump me. I can't wait. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. love it. I love that. Give energy. me your best shot. I mean, we'll go back to you know '80s music. Hit oh, me with yes. your best shot. <laughs> well, no, I'm we'll, not going to sing we'll, it. We'll, Let's see. I don't think this is going to stump you, but maybe it will. I don't know. Maybe you'll surprise us. Gosh, I hope so. Chuck, how do you respond to people who do not believe in ISD? Oh, that's great. I love that question. Because people that don't believe in it don't really know what it is. And it's like a lot of things if you don't know the complexity of it and where it came from and how it's used and all the other things, it's very easy to dismiss it. Say, oh, you know, that's just smoke and mirrors. And I've heard this so many times when I'm working with clients. And probably the most telling stories about this for me are in board meetings. And there will ultimately be a board member or someone in authority who will say, you know what, this is all crap. You know, I don't <laughs> need all of this design stuff. I can stand in front of a classroom and teach this content. I don't need you to tell me how to teach it. There's plenty of qualified people that can teach this. And so, you know, it's, it's all just bunk. And I'd say, okay, then why am I here? If this is working so great, why has your organization asked me to come in and fix the mess you got? And, you know, let's look at this realistically. And, you know, once you have that discussion, you know, a lot of it, if you read my work on SMEs, you know, these are Sentinel SMEs who at one point were pretty knowledgeable in their field. Now they've moved into different levels of management or authority and they're not quite as constantly uh, updated on the content, shall we say. And their role is to be that person sitting in the corner with their arms crossed that's gonna find something wrong with everything you do. And that's fine. I mean, I've had them get personal with me in board meetings and just saying, you know, you're wasting time. And I said, all right, well, do you know what I'm billing today? <laughs> <laughs> and then it kind of gets quiet for a second because you know me and my sense of humor oh I don't yes think it, I, nope. you know I'll, I'll just start shooting and you know eventually most of these people I'd say almost to a person have actually become friends over years because you know we just realized that we, we both have to do what we do but it doesn't mean we can't meet in the middle and fix these things so I say it's like finding common ground with somebody yeah. because we're not you know, always going to agree people skills absolutely it's all it's communication 101 we're not going to get along with everybody that we meet people are not going to like us we might not like them but if we can figure out what the common goal is and maybe work find a plan to be able to get to that common ground and to be able to at some point compromise but some you know just be able to work out a system where it's a win-win in the end because isn't that really what we all want is a win-win well i mean we want everybody to be successful i want every organization every learner in that organization to feel good about it and to walk away a better person a better skill set a better approach to something or whatever so when people don't believe and greg you know i know you you hear this too all the time it, that's okay let's have that conversation and one of the things I think that really moves people to believe in this is if you go back through the eight generations of learning transfer and you look at how people have learned over time memorial back to the first two people, you know, whoever you believe that are, those people are, and how we started grunting and then we started talking and then we started writing and then we started printing and then we started, you know, all these things are upgrades. And since World War II, ISD has become a science because now we understand how people learn. We can be pretty good about how we get people to to move through and put things in short and long-term memory and retain information and be able to demonstrate mastery so as we go through this i think when you are able to move them and show them the science of it and the fact that it has evolved and that all the things they say were true at some point in this continuum from where we started to where we are now and they say oh okay it's like the horse and buggy to you know the model a to tesla to Neuralink, which will just 
you know, inject us with this thing and we'll be brilliant. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, wherever it goes with Elon, I'm on Elon's bus. You know, just put me in the back. I'm going to watch. For Very entertaining. Oh, he's tremendous. And what he did Saturday night um, talking about Asperger's was inspirational. So good for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Greg wants to know if there's going to be a door a door prize for. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. a 32 inch door. Um, you have your choice of Lujan or a hardwood. Um, just give us, you know, whether you need a 72 inch or not. Give us the specs. Yeah. It's all in the detail. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll just stand up front. I'll get in the truck. <laughs> That's it. So, all right. We have some questions that were actually emailed to us ahead of time as well because people weren't able to come on here with us. So let's run through some of these questions that people have. The first one is, how do I move from being a subject matter expert, expert to a designer? Well, I, that's how I got here. Um, I was a subject matter expert in several fields and given a responsibility to put together courses and programs. And when I got to the higher education level, working in a college, and it was for real, um, that's when I knew I needed help. So I was wisely told to to look for graduate programs, instructional design. And that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is just start to read up, just start to find out about instructional design because you already have the content knowledge. You, you don't have to worry about that part of it. And many subject matter experts put together incredible courses if they have an instructional design background. And it doesn't take certification or graduate or PhD or anything else unless you want it. And I would encourage you to do that because I, I think it offers you a lot more than just what you think on the surface. But just get interested. Just ask questions. And if you're working with instructional designers, ask them about their work. I mean, they should include you anyway, and they should ex express you know what they expect of you and what their design philosophy is and all those other things. But if they don't, get in there and start digging. And I would say the best designers start out as subject matter experts. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have that, they get that experience of working with instructional designers, being that subject matter expert, and something, a light bulb must click in their brain. I, I mean, I, can, I could feel if I were a subject matter expert and I um, came across instructional designer, I personally would be incredibly interested in how can I do that? Because I have these ideas. I know this content inside and out. Now, how can I design these courses? And I, I feel like that is almost a natural progression for some people if they're inclined yeah. to yep. be that the, the devil in the details type of person. Well, if you enjoy digging and digging deeper and getting to the bottom and then going a little bit farther, you're going to be a great instructional designer because we're all about detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so here's another one. How can I keep myself fresh and up to date as an ISD professional? In other words, how can I how can I stay like in the know, if you will? If you've been in this industry a while and you want to be able to just make sure you're 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 in the trends and you understand what's going on, new information. Yeah, I think it's like anything else. You've got to stay current, and how you do that. And there's obviously different ways. I think professional associations like ISPI and ATD are, are great ways to do this. Get into a local chapter, be part of your local design community, um, have regular conversations with people that are doing different kinds of work than you. And the other thing I would say to people that are designing a lot is get into things you don't know. You know, try different populations, try different implementation um, routes and challenge yourself. Because when you challenge yourself, you start to dig for information. You find out what the best practices are and what's the boilerplate for something that you might do. And I think LinkedIn has an incredible group of communities. UMBC has a great program and Dr. Williams, you know, there's always stuff going out with jobs and what have you that are part of our program. But I think mostly it's, it's about getting in and digging in and being part. So if you want to network, you want to be part of a community, find one of the local groups and get involved and, you know, put yourself out there a little bit, offer to be a, an officer, which most of us, <laughs> you know, kind of shy away from at 300 miles an hour. But, you know, they need leadership. They need people that know what they're doing and, you know, take your turn and do these things. But if you sit in isolation and you never read and you never look at other things that are going on, then you're going to be a one-trick pony. 
And that's okay if it works for you. Um, I have no value system in that. But if you want to stay current, there are just some incredible ways to do that. Yeah, that's really great advice. You know, speaking of local organizations, I personally don't belong to any at this point. And it's something that I do believe now that I'm getting my feet wetter and wetter and wetter in this in this field that it's something I really do need to do and yeah, what are some do. of the benefits of what do what does somebody do as a member of these organizations if you're not say an officer right away because obviously somebody new maybe would need to understand the organization on a higher level to, at first yeah I'd say if that. they ask you to be president the first night you might want to keep walking but you know other than that uh, I've had that happen air, with an organization plant, yeah. not an ISG one but I'm like not, yeah. maybe not the first night but first month a statewide organization and I went out of the room for a second and came back as president so oh, um, nice I think it's two things one is networking and one is information and I've said many times first time tonight but most of the jobs in this field come from networking and from people you know there's jobs in that all the time but a lot of the times, job announcements are a protocol that HR wants you to do. You can't fill a position until you announce it, and you go through all that. And, you know, fair game. That's fine. But I think the more people you know in the business that you're in, the more likely you are to hear about things and to be able to act on them. And you have a ready set of references and recommendations for people that are in the business. And also, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're running a boutique shop in ISD, and you're just working from home and keeping good and busy, this is a great way to get work because you will be surprised how many people are looking for that extra person to help out with one thing or another. So I, I think it's the social side, but I also think it's the information side. So listen to the people that come and talk at the group. Listen to the things they recommend in terms of resources and books and videos and you know YouTube channels like instructional design from the ground up, which I personally have not been able to see yet, but I hear is incredible. You know, and you just want to do things like that and, and keep yourself current, ask questions, get involved, network and do your best work. Yeah, absolutely. It's really getting involved. That's really the, the key. I think with anything that you pursue in life is getting involved, getting your hands dirty, rolling up the sleeves, getting in there and seeing what it's really like, applying what you're learning and what you're doing in, in all aspects of your life. Another question that somebody has is, how did you get started? in the ISD industry. You went a little bit into this in the beginning, but can yeah. you add anything? Well, I think as Greg said the other day when we interviewed him, you know, it's the accidental designer. None of us ever intend to be instructional designers. Yeah. I know of no high school student who's sitting in a counseling office saying they're daydreaming about being an instructional designer. Now, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I, I still I will buy dinner for anybody it, who's had it, that experience. It wasn't a it wasn't a job title that came up in my when I was in high school trying yeah, to figure out what no, I wanted to do with my life. The job titles that were suggested for me were things I won't even repeat. Like Same exclusive here. Catholic high school because I did not fit that mold, shall we say? But you know, it's you know I came through it from being a subject matter expert, and being a subject matter expert, I was expected to teach others what I did. And that's fine. I could share my knowledge, but I had no way to package that other than talk to people and do things on flip charts and you know, the things that people do naturally when they instruct. And those are all great things, but you come to a point in your professional life where you have to go beyond that. And that was my situation. I had to go beyond being one-on-one -on -one in a classroom with a group of people to now being able to distribute this across an entire college. And I was faced with taking an entire college online. And if you think about that, you know, if I thought about it now, I wouldn't do it. But, you know, I was young and stupid, so sure, I'll do that. And, you know, that's where you make that leap to, to get that extra training and find out what you're missing. Because just like any career, any field, it's the stuff you don't know that you don't know. And yes. it's the stuff you really need to know. So until you don't know, you don't know. And you kind of accept that and say, okay, you know, let, let's find out what I don't know. Let's find out how I can do this better and quicker and more efficiently. And that's, you know, how it evolved for me. And frankly, it, it takes a long time. You, you go in and you learn a lot quick and then you start to learn the fine points. And then you make some mistakes and you say, oh, okay, let's see what I did there. I can't do that again. And, and that's how it is with any career, but ISD is no different. You know, get in, get started, get your feet wet, learn the basics, and go out and make mistakes in great quantity. In great quantity, because I feel like it, 
somebody said something to me. I interviewed somebody for a UMBC Mic'd Up podcast once, and he said, fail up. He, yeah. the, the art of failing up is really, it, it is a professional, uh, anybody. It, it's humanity's way of being able to grow and be expand beyond your own realm of, of possibility. Well, and I think there's lots of examples of that in our current world situation. And I, I talk about Elon Musk, and you may like him or hate him, you know, it's just heading the point. But when he smacks, you know, millions of dollars worth of rocket back on the landing pad and just laughs, laughs, you know, that tells me I should feel good about my mistakes because he says, I learned something every time I blow one of these up. And he did. I mean, and now 15 took off and landed and it was perfect. And okay, so we're going to Mars. And yeah. I really think that that's a model, not that Elon came up with it. I just another example of it. There's millions of examples of it. But I think failing up is a good way to put it, too. That's great. But don't be afraid to make the mistake. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? You do I, it again. I always <laughs> ask the question. You know, this goes back to days when I used to work in a financial firm, and it stressed me out to have to talk to people about their money situations. The stress of that was unbelievable. And I yep. used to walk out of there with my just a huge lump in my throat every day until finally somebody said to me, is anyone going to die from this situation today? <laughs> and it put it into perspective because I'm not, I'm not digging into somebody's brain. I'm not, you know, I, the, no, no one's going to die from this situation today. And so I actually taped that to my monitor at that point in my life because that actually got me through. And when you realize it's okay to fail, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to say, I have no idea. Let me get back to you with that. It's okay to, you don't have to have all the answers. And so I think that's and really say, important. I think that's an important point for instructional design. Mm -hmm. And here I'm going to go off the deep end, but there are times when it does make a difference. A mistake can mean a life or well, lives. Yeah. And I found that in law enforcement. I found it in emergency management and other things that I've done that can't even talk about. <laughs> but the notion is that's why instructional design is so important because you want people to fail in a safe environment before there's any greater value to making a mistake than doing it over. So in instructional design, one of the principles that we always talk about is we want learners to fail in our safe environment so we can nurture them and mentor them and get them to a point of mastery. So when it happens in actual life, so the reality of the situation is, yes, we need to make these kind of decisions that you've already thought this through. You've always felt that emotion. You've already gone through that. And the more realistic you can make a scenario for learning in those situations, more likely you're going to have very successful outcomes on the other end. So, you know, desktop things in emergency management where, you know, a 12 earthquake happens, you know, just ridiculous things and all the, the ramifications of that. And you go through it. And then when you have a situation like a hurricane or, you know, other things that happen around the world and emergency managers rush out and do tremendous things, they've already had the opportunity to think about this thing. They've yeah. already made that one or two decision that they wish they wouldn't have made, but they made it in a safe environment. They had experts there to help them through that and say, okay, let's look at that and let's see if that's the best idea. So this, I think, is the greatest fail safe in all of training and learning is this principle of let's fail where it's safe, where we can help. Yeah, and there's there's comfort in that for a lot of people. I know there is for me, knowing that it's a... I call it a, a playground, really. And yeah. now this is this is not life and death, but joining Toastmasters, that's what it is for me. It's a playground for me to be able to, it's a safe environment for me, be able yep. to, for me to be able to practice public speaking and to be able to mess up, forget my lines, stumble, <laughs> we all have do. a panic attack, whatever it might be. Or try to record a script for a YouTube channel. Or try that. So, <laughs> and we know that. We failed up a lot on that one. Uh, did we fail? Yes, we did. <laughs> but it was all in good fun, right? And we learned was, and we I grew mean, out of the experience. <laughs> yeah, and, and the trailer now is better, but certainly not excellent. We just went off the if cuff. You'd have, if you'd have seen the first one, you would thought we were introducing mortuary science <laughs> for the masses. Uh, it was just awful. So... <laughs> Oh, that was funny. We learned. We, we learned. See, that's what it is. Yeah, that was our little playground. Uh, we have another question. What do you say to these people who say ISD is too slow? 
They want rapid <laughs> ISD. Yeah, it's too slow. So is your failure. It comes instantly. Um, you know, I've had that conversation with lots of groups. And again, back to the board kind of issues, you know, how can you justify all this? And why does it take so much time? I said, well, how much time did it take you to fail? Um, which thusly brought me to you today. Um, you know, if you want to look through this, how long does it take to, to do certain things in your life? You know, what do you want to rush? What do you want to do the quick way? You want your medical stuff quick? Do you want your financial stuff quick? You know, I can find folks that could do all this for you in 30 seconds. Um, Will you be happy with the results? I doubt it. And since this is a science, you got to remember there is process. There are ways that all this takes place. And just doing a survey can take weeks. Doing focus groups takes weeks to set up. Doing all kinds of things, putting together materials. If you want first class materials, it takes time because that's somebody's professional work and you have to go through it. And the things that people don't think about is how many versions of something you have to go through. So, yeah, the materials are done, but oh gosh, that's not the right color or it's not the look we wanted. I've seen entire books that were one inch too long or one inch too wide, and it took a complete redesign and repagination. And things take time. If you want a quality product in any field or endeavor, it takes time. Yeah. You can speed things up. And you can do rapid prototyping in ISD, and lots of people do it. Um, certainly works, but that's in larger organizations where they do the same kind of courses every day and they use the same implementation. So they've got a learning management system where the shells are already pretty much there. You just poke in new equipment. You know, okay, let's have new objectives and tasks and evaluations. And, but the model is there. The prototype is there. Mm -hmm. So if you want quality, it takes time. Um, if you don't want to have that kind of quality or you're not willing to invest the time, then it's fine. You know, there's no value judgment there, but this is what you get for the amount of time it takes. And the other thing you find is after you do it for a while, it's actually much quicker because you don't have to go back and fix things after they don't work. And that's the one thing that people don't realize. When we give you a product, it's going to work. You know, we've tested it. We've got enough experience to know what's going to happen or not happen. We've hopefully done pilot testing. So when you get that product, you know, go run with it. Um, if you don't do that, I can tell you hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of organizations that go back and fix things after they've been implemented or after they've gone live. And you think that doesn't take time. It mm -hmm. takes twice as much time. Plus, then you got your reputation and credibility that you have to think about. So, yeah, it takes more time. So what? <laughs> yeah, that's 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 it. That's your take on rapid design. <laughs> yeah, Definitely. So, you know, if you don't agree with me, far away. But that's just one of my experiences. You know, after a while, it isn't really taking much longer. It's yeah. it's. But there's this whole notion of there's so much going on that it takes longer. And yeah, there's a lot going on. But. You've got to do the due diligence. You just have to. You have to do the due diligence. And like you said, spend the time up front doing it. And then you won't have to spend the time at the end doing it. And then if you don't have to spend the time at the end doing it, meaning redoing it, then your reputation is not at stake, which that's a big thing. You want to Well, organizations want to have successes. And yeah. I want organizations to have successes. And I want college professors to have successes in their courses. And I want you know, anybody that's doing this to feel good about the product and be able to take it out there and show it off and be successful with it. And that doesn't happen by accident. You know, there's that small percentage of things that go well no matter what you do to them. And, you know, that's terrific. But that's not, it's not most work yeah. in any field. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly not in ours. So, Chuck, we've been on here for 50 minutes. Can you believe that? And my apologies wow, to everyone. Oh no, it's been We'll never amazing. get that time back. <laughs> but That's you know fun. what time it is, right? You know no, what time no it idea. is, right? It's we, time for me to go. No, we we got to take this. We got to take this thing. I got to become Vanna. We got to do the wheel, <sighs> and Denise. we we got to spin this wheel and see where it lands and see what kind of fun question yeah, we're going to see. Chuck I can't. Answer. I can't even imagine. Are you ready? Let's, gonna... let's let's. No, do I'm not ready. See, I need not to figure out. I need some training. Uh, I have a spin course. We'll get that for you. Okay. Me. I'm asking you, what is your favorite quote, Chuck? It's my favorite. 
putting you on <laughs> putting you on the spot. That's my favorite quote. I will tell um, you mine. Well, if you if you want to think about it for a moment, I'll yeah, tell you ahead. my What's favorite yours? quote. It's written by it, it, it's one of my favorite movies, The Shawshank Redemption, and it's Get Busy Living or Get Busy Dying. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I now love I'm depressed. <laughs> No, I love that. I love that quote because it really is. Life is so short, right? And we have all of these opportunities that are around us. And if we choose to ignore those opportunities, then we might as well just be, we might as well just put ourselves on the couch with the remote control and just never leave the house. So that to me is what that quote means. It, it gets me, it gets me off the couch. It puts the remote down. <laughs> it really does because I feel, I feel When's like, the last time you laid on the couch? Oh television? man. Well, at the day after I had my COVID shot, the second vaccine, yeah, okay. I will so say I spent that, the entire day in bed with the remote yeah. control. I but, had a week off. Well, was, yeah. Yeah. So God bless everybody got their shots. I hope you Absolutely. Well but that's to me that to me is my favorite quote because okay, it gets me up in the it's morning. Not, it's not really a quote, it's a philosophy. All right, let's hear that it. That I have heard quoted. Wake up every morning and smell the coffee. I like it. Okay. And where that you know, you've heard that a thousand times. Yes. But where it works for Karen and I, Karen, my wife, is, you know, I'm a cancer survivor, so I've kind of looked over the edge of that and and seen the alternatives and all of you are out there that have been through similar life situations um, will appreciate that. There's no guarantee for tomorrow. There's no guarantee of after this broadcast that somebody won't find me. <laughs> say, why did you say that? Um, but the notion is every morning, Karen, and I get up and say, you know, thank you. You know, it's another day. We appreciate wow. this opportunity and we're going to smell the coffee and we're going to try to do something good today for somebody else. And, you know, whether it's philanthropic or sentimental or gooey, or, you know, whatever you want to think about it. But it really is the way I look at life now. You know, every morning is a new day. I'm going to do my best. Yeah. Great words to live by. Melody says, my current favorite quote is, be brave enough to suck at something new. Oh, I love it. <laughs> melody, that's so cool. Yes. Of course, that's, a, that's a melody thing. I can see that. Oh, so, I love that. Yeah. No, I mean, well, you look at my life and there's, you know, it's, who was the guy that ran for president out of Tennessee or out of Texas? Um, gosh, what was his name? Mm. He was a, <laughs> like a bazillionaire and he was always on Larry King. And he would say, Larry. <laughs> but he always said the big sucking sound, you know, when he was talking about what was wrong with this country. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, that's exactly right. Go out and make mistakes. You know, I could not be happier than when people generate mistakes and learn from them and move on. Because there is exactly where it's all at, right there in the center. Yeah, absolutely. Good oh, job, Melody. Very good job. And anybody who is on right now or watch, going to watch the replay, put your quote, put your favorite quote in the comments. Inspire us all. Let's let's share in the let's share in the inspiration. Okay, so we're done with the wheel now. No, we're doing one more, Chuck. One more. You're not going to get off that easily. Oh, I'm sorry. I told you. I told you in the beginning, I'm going to rig this thing because there's a, there is a question. This is, this is really not a wheel of we, Okay. So this you, is a wheel of Denise. When we started talking first, anybody who caught the beginning of this, Chuck was talking about the way he writes things down. You know, there, he has a hard time writing certain words down. And afterwards he looks at it and he says, what the heck is that? Right? What did I do? So I'm curious because this runs, I run into this all the time. Is there a word that you always misspell? Like it just, no matter. Chuck. <laughs> oh, Chuck. <laughs> Chuck, Chuck, Chuck. <laughs> You're not playing fair. I'm not going to play fair. Um, word that I always misspell. Cincinnati. Yes. Connecticut. You know Connecticut. I, 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 I can do Rhode Island, so I'm okay with where you came from. Okay, that's good. But when you grow up in Dayton, if you can't spell Dayton, that indicates di bigger issues. But there was always this thing about how you spell Cincinnati, and people think there's two ends and two places, and there aren't. 
So mm-hmm. that was kind of a test when I was growing up, if you could spell it. And there was actually a song, which just tells you how boring Ohio is <laughs> about how to spell Cincinnati. So I think that was always, uh, you know, it explains a lot, doesn't it? Oh, well, you know. I hope my, my daughter, Heather, is watching who's a therapist. She can <laughs> offer me some mantras to get me through this crisis. But uh, <laughs> so... Also, I know, as Jess is out there, Jess, you don't have any questions. I can't believe you don't have any questions. See if Jess is that on That pressure here. is on. Or Joe or David or anybody. Anybody? Uh, no. Anybody? No. Come on. This is your chance to get even. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So, so I don't know. Are you one, done with the wheel? One more and you want spin? one more? Okay. Let's do one yeah, more. People, people are on the edge of their I know. laptops. I know. I'm getting good practice, too, with this, centering yeah. it in my screen here. Okay. Oh, what's your favorite word? Hmm. Well, I could be a hippie and say love and peace. Either of those would be good. Um, I think caring, giving, you know, things that reflect my philosophy on what people should do in their lives. And this whole notion of paying forward and giving back. And those things are important to me. They really are. Yeah. And so any word that engenders that, I think, is perfect. Whatever variety of vowels and consonants that work for you on that. But <laughs> any of those are great. I love it. I was going in a different direction. My favorite word, it's the reason why I, it's my favorite word is it's fun to say. Quintessential. And it's <laughs> funny because the reason why this came up is we so Hector and I we take voice and articulation classes every week so I can oh, learn I how to get that. rid of Good for you I too. can learn That's how to great. smooth over my accent so I can No it's, it's not right? working. It's not. I know. I, I I hear you. I hear you. But I'm getting rid of my list. And I say that it's getting better. Cuz I actually like your accent. It's like my Ohio accent which most people can't pick up anymore because I've been on the West Coast. Too long, Everybody but... thinks I'm from Long Island. I'm not. I'm from Rhode Island. Yeah. Long Island is a whole different. Oh, my goodness. But anyway, yeah. our voice and articulation coach used that word this week. And we, I just, I fell in love with the word. We just, we say it all the time now. This whole week, all we do is talk about quintessential, quintessential. Anyway. Thanks for <laughs> indulging me on that one. Okay. Okay. Spell it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to write that. I have to write it okay. down. Visual person. So what I teach oh, at the Mason Put me on the spot here. I have a, a student who's from Saskatchewan. Oh, imagine spelling that And I that challenge one. everybody in the class to be able to spell Saskatchewan. That's a tough and one. And so far after seven years, no one has been able to do that without Google. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a variation. Wow. You could put that on your wheel, too. Words you hate to spell. Yeah, I think I'm going to. (laughs) Chuck, everybody, this has been so fun. Thank you for being here for our first live session. It, it, I liked it. I didn't have to. I didn't get to use this, so you know. Yeah, well, it's still early. It's all right. (laughs) We pull that out quite often in our pre-recorded sessions. I don't know if it's a perfectionism thing, or we just get silly, or what happens. I I think it's my lack of ability to speak well for a while there you were going blurry and so yeah you can't really call besides you blurry the technical anymore, issue no no no, it's not, no you've it's been not nice legitimate. and clear and focused today it's all good we yeah, got it down focused. yeah perot perot greg says yeah yeah ross perot, perot. yes ross perot oh larry <laughs> yes larry <laughs> Remember? I do remember that. Yeah. yeah. He was the one who saw a killer rabbit on the lake. Remember that? No. Yeah, that was kind no. of the end of his political career. <laughs> I don't remember that. He, he had this moment at the lake. I don't think it was quite right after that. But mm. Larry. <laughs> yeah, I love Dross. He was so much fun. Uh, well, we're going to close out this one. Greg has a really great quote here from Mark Twain. All people are ignorant. Only on different subjects. <laughs> yeah, well, Greg knows me better than most, so he's probably got a short list of 300 things I'm ignorant on. I'll so add that we'll one just in keep there. that between us, right, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has been great. So 
Yeah, I want to. Yeah, we want to thank you for being here, for helping to celebrate Chuck's launch day for his new textbook out there in the world. And we have been, we started a new playlist for this textbook. They're called, they're called chapter chats. And it's like a tongue twister, chapter chats. And so we will be recording, I think there are 17 chapters, right, Chuck? 17 we yeah. got one done we've got so one done chapter one three go check years it out in we'll the, be doing these <laughs> go check it out in the playlist and it's really just a synopsis of like a, a talk i should say about they're like 10 or 15 minute chapter chats going over the key concepts of the chapters of the textbook and it's to me it's really enlightening as a student of isd so it's uh go check it out if you're interested in this subject it's really i think I think you'll enjoy that playlist. We'll be adding to that as we move along. And if you have any topics you want to hear us discuss, you have questions, just go ahead and put them in the comments here and we'll, we'll get to them or come onto LinkedIn and, you know, and let us know, tap, tap into us there and, and ask us the questions. Subscribe to the channel as well. That would be great. We would appreciate the support. We hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for being here with us today. It's been a pleasure.